Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, thank you all so much for uh, tuning in to see my talk. I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to share some of my research with you. Um, and even though I had just learned that the title of my talk is a tongue twister, I, I hope that you uh, learn a little bit uh, as we go along here. So I study fungi, a group of organisms that people often view as being esoteric or mysterious, um, or they are just completely overlooked um, some of the time as well. However, human fungal pathogens are on the rise, fungal plant pathogens, threatened food systems, and in a time of increasingly rapid environmental change, fungi perform many essential ecosystem services um, that help us maintain resilient ecosystems. And I study a particular type of fungi. So these are lichens. Uh, these are fungi that form obligate mutualistic symbioses with green algae or cyanobacteria, um, or sometimes both of those photosynthetic partners. Um, and lichens comprise about 20% of all described fungal diversity. That's about 20,000 species. Uh, they occur in every single terrestrial ecosystem on this planet. Um, and as you could imagine, a group of organisms that is everywhere, including just out the door here, um, does perform numerous essential ecosystem services. They're important in the carbon and the nitrogen cycle. Um, they are integral members of food webs, um, and we as humans use them most frequently to monitor air quality um, and to monitor the presence of other pollutants. <clears throat> and another fascinating thing about lichens when compared to other groups of fungi is that they form these really stable, long-lived macroscopic structures um, that you see, some of which you can see here on uh, the right side of my slide. So rather than um, kind of microscopic growth forms that maybe uh, produce ephemeral fruiting bodies occasionally, uh, these structures can live for decades and in some cases centuries. So they're cool fungi. Um, and from an evolutionary perspective, they're an excellent model system. Uh, so lichenization has evolved at least 10 times independently across the fungal tree of life. So we have a great system for um, some independent contrasts here. Um, in addition to those main symbionts, the fungal and photosynthetic symbionts, they, each lichen hosts a rich community of bacteria, of endolichenic fungi, and microinvertebrates, especially nematodes and tardigrades. Um, so in many ways, each lichen is a miniature ecosystem system in and of itself. Now, there have been about um, a thousand different secondary metabolites characterized from lichens. Most of these are organic acids. Um, and some of them have shown potential use for in industrial and pharmaceutical applications. Finally, they're a really tractable and economical system for evolutionary genomics research. Um, but this is not a point that I would have included on a slide five years ago. Um, because they have such a rich um, back community going on in each of them, it actually was really challenging to study them when our, um, you, our typical tool was short read data. Um, most of these fungi are very challenging to culture or impossible, um, so we're often using samples from nature directly. Um, so uh, with the advent of long read sequencing, though, we've really been able to unlock this system. So when I started my lab in the fall of 2018, um, I I decided to really develop um, a workflow for generating fungal genomes from these complex metagenomic samples uh, using the Nanopore platform. Nobody had done this in lichens before. Um, and I work at a primarily undergraduate institution. Um, I don't have a great deal of research resources or time or funding. Um, so really, the Nanopore platform was the perfect solution here. Additionally, it allowed me to actually do all of uh, this work with students so they could have that hands-on experience. Um, so you can see the picture here on the left. Um, that's the first genome that we were sequencing. There's the minion on my office desk. Um, we then went on to um, study some really tiny species and collaborate with a number of Canadian lichenologists. Um, and at this point, we have our first full chromosome assembly in press. That's from a metagenomic sample. Um, and we finally are to the point 
um, where we're just routinely generating these fungal genomes. It's become a relatively rapid, straightforward process. Um, and to date, we've generated 19 genomes. Uh, and once all of those are released publicly, um, that will nearly double the number of publicly available genomes for this group of organisms. Okay, so I'll share a few uh, research vignettes with you here. So the first lichen that we uh, decided to study is the wolf lichen shown here. So it's this lovely bright yellow species. It's common and abundant in the region of the world where I live, which is Washington State in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I thought this would be a great system because um, it's also very easy to identify. So undergraduate students can easily collect it. And indeed, uh, this is a picture of the first undergraduate student who took on a project in my lab, Ridge Walston, and he, he did a fantastic job of collecting throughout the state um, and uh, conducting a lot of the laboratory research with this. Okay, so I thought, okay, common abundant, this is going to be easy. And you see this, or so I thought there, so you know that there's a little foreshadowing, something, there will be a twist. Um, we'll get to that. Okay, so this was the lichen that we used to really troubleshoot all of the laboratory methods, the bioinformatics methods. Um, and you can see that uh, this was the workflow we used, and it's a little bit uh, dated. Um, this was a number of years ago now, um, but this was kind of our jumping off point. And one of our big challenges was figuring out that metagenomic binning and filtering, um, and by uh, using some homology-based searches and looking at depth and GC content, we felt very confident that we were pulling out that main fungal symbionts genome and getting the complete, pretty much the complete genome there. Um, now, most lichens in Ascomycota are haploid. Most of the lichen, most uh, fungi in Ascomycota are haploid. And we assumed that most lichens um, in that phylum are haploid as well. But it turned out that actually this individual that we sequenced um, in that sample, there were three distinct haplotypes present at equal ratios, suggesting that it was triploid. Um, and we, uh, I really did not expect that to be the outcome of this research. And then when we looked at the population data, um, the DDRAD-seq data, we found that about 70% of the individuals were triploid. Um, most of the rest were haploid, and there were a few diploid individuals in there as well. Um, so that suggests that there are some more complex evolutionary processes going on here, perhaps hybridization. Okay. Next, I'll talk a little bit about the reproductive biology of a particular group of lichens. Um, lichen reproduction is somewhat complicated. Any given lichen can reproduce via multiple different modes, um, either one at a time or multiple at a time in various different ratios. Um, and we can broadly group uh, their reproductive modes into three categories. The first is lichenized asexual reproduction. Um, in this mode of reproduction, there are specialized bundles of fungal and algal cells that break off very easily from that main lichen body and produce an exact clone of that original lichen. They can produce fungal asexual spores via mitosis. Um, in that case, we have dispersal, germination, and resynthesis of the symbiosis. Um, and many species can reproduce sexually as well. So producing meiotic spores, again, we have a symbio symbiont resynthesis step. Um, and then for sexual reproduction to occur again, uh, that individual has to encounter an alternate suitable mating type. Um, and this is what we call a heterothallic mating system, um, where there are two different mating types. Um, and this system, um, that recognition of a suitable mate comes down to the mating type genes, these mat genes. Uh, there are a number of other reproductive systems in fungi, but in the lichen fungal species in which the reproductive mode has been characterized, uh, we see a heterothallic system. Okay. However, there are quite a few lichens that only reproduce with these lichenized asexual propagules, many species and actually many groups of lichens that have never been observed to produce any other reproductive structures, which raises a number of questions. The first is, are these are putatively asexual groups truly clonal? Second, how frequently do non-meiotic recombination processes mediate gene flow between individuals instead of or in addition to meiotic recombination? And finally, do obligate symbioses rebalance this trade-off 
between asexual and sexual reproduction and really shift that balance towards asexual reproduction. So we're following up on a number of these questions in my lab. And um, a, one of my master's students, Bubba Peffer, is actively working on these. Um, and they're using the system of the dust lichens, um, or I prefer the fairy dust lichens. I think it's a bit more imaginative. Um, but these are uh, lichens in the genus Lepraria. This genus includes about 50 species, uh, many of which are very abundant, very widespread, uh, but none of which have been observed producing any of these other uh, reproductive structures, um, despite being rather diverse. Um, and so this is really a perfect study system uh, to follow up on these questions. So far, we've assembled a genome from Lepraria neglecta. Um, and this is our full chromosome assembly. I have a cartoon of our assembly graph there um, showing that six of the chromosomes have been assembled telomere to telomere, and the other two have a telomere on one end but not the other. Um, so all graph edges with telomeric reads mapping are outlined with a dotted line there. And that was from a metagenomic sample. We also recovered a mating type locus that has a, that um, has a structure that we expect to see for a mating, any given mating type locus in these fungi, um, and it has a MAT2 mating system. Um, and we also recovered a MAT11 pseudogene in that mating type locus as well. We've now sequenced the genome of, five, of four other species in this genus. Um, some of these species are, have that MAT12 mating type. Um, and the others have this MAT11 mating type. So we now know that both mating types are present in this genus. Um, we've generated uh, short read whole genome sequence data for hundreds of individuals for multiple of these species to follow up and see if, uh, that it, if the two different mating types are present within any of these given species uh, and to actually test for genome-wide recombination in them as well. Um, but it, so at this point, we have some great reference genomes to start working with. Okay, finally, um, as I mentioned earlier, we now have this set of 19 genomes that we're working with. Um, so I'll start with, I'll give you a bit of a peek at what we're doing in looking across all of these genomes. So this graph shows all of the publicly available lichenized fungal genomes uh, that have been generated with short read data in the turquoise. Um, or in that dark turquoise, all of the lichen fungal genomes that have been generated with long read data outside of my lab are in gray, and then all of the genomes that we've generated in my lab are in this bright blue color. So we've managed to generate um, all of the most contiguous genomes for these fungi, and again, once we release them, we'll nearly double the number of available genomes um, in this group. So now we get to the fun stuff. What can we do with this, right? OK. Uh, now, two of these species were of particular interest because they're species of conservation concern. Um, and they had relatively large genomes uh, compared to the other lichens that we looked at. The first is Sulcaria isidifera, um, which was sequenced with support from the org.1 program um, and in collaboration with Eli Balderus. The species is listed as critically endangered. It's narrowly endemic to Morro Bay, California. And the second species is Pseudocyphalaria rainerensis, which was sequenced uh, by Stephen Sherritt, who's a master's student in my lab now, um, in collaboration with Lolita Calabria from the Evergreen State College. And this species is an old growth forest associate in the Pacific Northwest. We're still working on the red list assessment, but our preliminary assessment places it in the vulnerable category. Okay, so I saw, okay, both of these species are rare and endangered. Um, they have relatively large genomes, and I hypothesized that, you know, potentially there was an expansion in the um, repetitive uh, element content in these genomes. Um, and indeed, in looking at the numbers here, the total in interspersed repeats in Sulcaria um, came out at about 47%, and in Pseudocyphalaria, it's almost 70% of the genome. This is much higher than most other lichens, um, and I followed up on this, um, this observation and wanted to look at this in a more robust phylogenetic framework. So um, here we have six species, two species from each of three genera, 
in each of these pairs of species, one of those species is common and widespread, and that's shown in the top of each of these pairs, and the other species is rare um, and range-restricted. And to give you a sense of how different these species distributions are from each other, you can see Lepraria neglecta there on the bottom, basically a, a worldwide species with a global distribution, um, and Lepraria lanata, which is um, a narrow endemic to the southern Appalachian Mountains, uh, currently listed as endangered on the red list. Um, and indeed, uh, when looking at these pairs of species, uh, we do see the accumulation of potentially harmful retrotransposons in the rare and range-restricted species when compared to those more common and widespread species. Okay. And we're just starting to get to the point of asking, what makes a lichen a lichen? What happens in this major trophic transition um, to this obligate symbiosis? Um, and so in this analysis, uh, we looked at species across Ascomycota um, with a diversity of trophic strategies. So all of the species names that are in black there um, have our saprotrophs or parasites um, or mycorrhizal fungi. And then all of the lichen species names are in green, and they, we just have one lineage of lichens sampled here. Um, and then in, when, looking at, um, when looking at ortho groups across the genome and looking for gene families that are significantly contracted or expanded in lichens versus non-lichens, um, we did find a few significant groups here. So the ortho, those gene families in which we see significant contraction uh, represent genes involved in amino acid transportation and iron transport and in protein metabolism. The gene families where we see significant expansion are involved in lipid metabolism. So this suggests to us that in that transition to lichenization, there's some major shifts in nutrient transport and in primary metabolism. And we're now really well situated to follow up on this uh, finding and sample other lichen lineages to see if we, we see that same pattern. Okay, so as I mentioned towards the beginning of this talk, um, I work at a primarily undergraduate institution. Um, so all of this work has been done uh, with students at Eastern Washington University. And it's really been a privilege to be able to do some cutting edge genomics research with these students and actually get to work with them um, in this, like, for in the, through this whole process from sample collection, library preparation, sequencing, all of the bioinformatics workflow, um, and then coming to this point of asking some larger scale evolutionary questions. Uh, so if there are any other educators in the audience, um, you know, I've developed some educational tools through all of this. I'm happy to share those resources. Okay, and so with that, I'd like to thank my students, past and present, uh, my many collaborators, and my funding sources. And I'd be happy to take any questions. <laughs>